Time for me has always been an adversary. My life has been about defying time. In my work and in my life, I've seen how a moment can squeeze and dilate, and how, in the span of a moment, the entire course of a life can change. Three years ago, I was in China making a documentary film called Hooligan Sparrow. I had been following some of the most courageous women's rights activists in China, led by a woman named Ye Haiyan, also known as Hooligan Sparrow. They staged a public protest against a school principal and a government official who had raped six young girls. But at the time, the government was covering up the crime. Dissent is effectively banned in China. The government reacted to the protest with an intense wave of harassment, intimidation, arresting the activists, chasing them across the country. I was there with them for every moment, documenting it with my camera. In some cases, a hidden camera. Simply by being present with the activists, I too became a target of the government. The police confiscated my camera. They intimidated and harassed my family and friends. And eventually, three national security agents came, and they interrogated me for five hours. Ultimately, I talked my way out of the interrogation and made it out to the U.S. But that moment of the interrogation remains in my mind. In that moment, the hours. Felt like years, and how I handled it could potentially change my entire life. Moments like that have shaped my perception of time. I'd like to share with you a story from my childhood, when I first became aware of time. I grew up in a small, remote village in China, where the highest education in that village was elementary school. When I was nine. My parents had to send me away to the boarding school in the city. Sending me away was hard on my parents, but for me, it was devastating. My father was my best friend. When I left home, my only means of communicating with him was through the long letters we wrote to each other. And during the summer vacation, I would go back to visit and spend as much time as I could with my father. Even. As a child, I knew that my father, my time with my father was really precious, precious. Because when September came, I'd be sent back to the boarding school. In the summer of 1997, I was 11. One night, I woke up around two o'clock in the morning and saw my dad sitting on the couch. I asked him why he was up at such a late hour. He didn't answer. He didn't turn to look at me. I woke my mom. She called his name. He sat there, expressionless. I didn't know what was happening. I put a pen in his hands, hoping that he could communicate with me through writing, as what we did when we were apart from each other. I let go of the pen in his hands. It fell through his fingers and down to the floor. I stood there watching him as my mom ran to find help. At that time, we didn't own a car, and there were no telephones in our village. My mom ran to friends' houses, hoping to find someone who could take my father to a hospital. Eventually, we found a car and carried my father into the back seat to begin the 100-mile journey to the nearest hospital. When we got to the hospital, we learned that his brain was hemorrhaging at the point. The doctor gave my mom two options: without a procedure to stop the bleeding, he would die within 24 hours; attempt a brain surgery, he might survive, but he might also die during the surgery process because of his history of heart disease. The time to make that decision was really limited. My mom chose to let them operate. 
The surgery was eight hours long. I waited at the hospital together with my mom. I could feel the weight of those eight hours as they slowly passed. The vividness of my memory of those hours still surprises me. I remember hearing the gurney approaching, doctors and nurses talking, and hoping that it would be my father's gurney coming. But it never happened. He didn't survive the surgery. He was 33 years old, and I was 11. In the tradition of our village, they brought him back and laid him on the floor of our home. He would lie there for three days, under a white sheet, surrounded by candles, as people filed in and out for a final visit. I spent each of those three days kneeling down in front of him. I stared at his face, his body, for hours and hours, hoping that I could notice small movement in his muscles or in his eyes. I thought about our special ways of communicating. Maybe all the people who said he was dead just didn't know our secrets, and I was the only one who knew that he didn't die. On the third day, they put him in the coffin and buried him in the ground. I cried in a way I never had, not because that he was dead and gone and I knew it, but because I imagined he was alive. I thought those people had trapped him in the box, and he would be cold, starved, and suffocated. I thought the people who buried my father had murdered him. Gradually, I came to understand what happened. I realized that a person could die at 33 years old, and that death is random and can come for any person at any time. In the years that followed, I became convinced that the same thing happened to my father would happen to me. I believed that I would die when I turned 33. The timeline for my life was suddenly condensed, and the way I saw the world would never be the same. Time has manipulated me into looking at life differently. I became determined. To live each minute as if there were two minutes, to live each day as if there were two days, so that I could earn back the time that had been taken away from my father. I decided that I was going to live my life as if I were living for both myself and for my father. My desire to live more than one life grew over the years. I found a way to put myself through vocational training. Then different jobs, then college, and then graduate schools. But it wasn't until 2011, when I came to the U.S., I discovered documentary films. Immediately, I recognized the medium as a way to take control of time, to manipulate it, to multiply it. Documentary films allow audiences to visit places that they've never been to. And to hear about people and ideas and cultures that they've never heard of, but for documentary filmmakers, these experiences are physically real. When I'm shooting in the field, I live with my subjects. I get into their minds. When I was making Hooligan Sparrow, I lived with the Chinese human rights activists for three months. Together, we went to the protest, and we were forced to flee from one city to another across the country to avoid the police harassment. Their experience became mine, at least to a degree. And on another project, I followed the life of a homeless person on the streets of Florida, and lived his lifestyle. I ate out of garbage cans and slept on the sidewalks. In order to bring my subjects' stories to life, I live their lives, lives that are different from mine. In this way, every time I make a film, the film also makes me. And I'm not spending time, and I'm not working. I'm stealing time, and I'm earning time. 
documentary filmmakers can also control time during the editing process. We can choose to seize any moment in time to carefully study, and then we can skip days or years or generations forward in an instant before settling on another moment to study. There are tricks that storytellers use to play with time. We can slow it down, we can speed it up, we can flash back, we can flash forward. And when eventually a film is finished, with Sharing it with an audience is his own experience in time traveling. The audience rides along with the story, traveling through time as naturally as they would travel from one point on a map to another. It's through storytelling that time temporarily loses its grip on us and on our perception of the world. In being a filmmaker, I'm very fortunate. To have this extra dimension of choosing any moments in time to study with a subject, and then eventually with an audience, I'm grateful for this and for finally finding a way to be in charge of time. Thank you.